what I'm going to tell you in the second half is kind of um, not related to all these modern Hoffbill network things, but much more still related to these projection methods and all these things. But um, I just want to emphasize who did the work. The person who did all the work was Maria, who's my graduate student on the left. We couldn't have done this without our decade long stem cell collaborators. Um, Michael is a postdoc at the BU Center for Regenerative Medicine. Laertis is now at University of Buffalo, but he was at BU Center for Regenerative Medicine, which is run by Daryl Cotton. And there are these MD PhDs, well, Laertis isn't, but like they, they're basically trying to make lungs using directed differentiation thing. And actually the reason I got back into this is because they had heard, I had, I learned biology from them and they came back to me two, three years ago. They took my very spurious attractor thing very seriously and they thought they had found something. So the fact that biologists took my nonsense ranting seriously made me want to come back and try this thing again. So the basic idea of all this stuff is that um, I'm going to try to convince you that actually the ideas that I showed you in the last talk can give you really practical tools for analyzing really complicated and messy data. All right. So this is going to be a data analysis talk, which is kind of weird because I don't consider myself a data analysis, but I think data analysis is actually very hard probably one of the more, more underappreciated skills in biophysics. Um, and so the problem I'm th that we're thinking about is again, the emergence of sulfates and organisms from the interactions of genes and proteins. Uh, I'm gonna focus on lung development for the reasons I outlined before, which is that those are our really good experimental colleagues. I can go bug them about questions, they'll do experiments, stuff like that. And what I wanted to just point out is, you know, it's a very complicated, you know, complicated, process. You start at day 8.5, 11.5, and the lung is basically developed through the stage. It's born after, you know, a mouse is born after 19 days, and then you have this post-birth 0 and 14. And you can see what I'm really going to talk about is these very specialized cell types in the lung, right? But this is a very complicated dynamical process. What, why am I telling you this about, why, why did I, am I talking about development? I told you about the Hoffield model before. So the basic idea was that, like, you know, I was thinking about this problem, God, I'm old, uh, like <laughs> um, 12, 13 years ago, 12 years ago. And it occurred to me that, you know, the pictures that people always draw are these classical pictures due to Waddington, which are shown on the right. And what it is, is basically the idea is that, you know, you think of this, again, his idea was you think about development some dynamical system and the minima of this kind of whatever he called developmental potential, poorly defined, corresponds to the sulfates I see, right? And so again, it occurred to us that what's interesting is what we get to see in development are in some sense the attractors, right? We get to see the final sulfates that you, that you see, and we want to understand the dynamical system that gives rise to these sulfates, right? And we know that this is a dynamical system composed of genes interacting with each other, doing crazy stuff. And so our basic idea was, okay, let's like try to use this Hoffield construction, right? And the Hoffield construction, this is just some random network I stole some from some, from actually a pretty nice paper, but I just wanted something complicated enough. You don't have to pay attention to all the arrows and what all that stuff means. But the basic idea was, oh, look, this looks like the Hoffield model. I know the attractors I want, and I'm going to say that the developmental network, I can reconstruct it after the fact and think about it in an inverse problem. And so we wrote this kind of paper with my old student, Alex Lang, and we were really proud of it. The basic idea is we said, oh, let's take this gene expression profile that, you know, from back then microarrays, which seems like infinity ago. Um, and we said, oh, here are the cell types. We'll, you know, convert it to binary using some histone mark data. And then I can use this, what I described was this projection method to calculate this energy landscape. And we were really happy because it explained a lot of data and made a lot of predictions that, you know, that like it could predict how I reprogram from cell type to cell type. We made many of those predictions and the experiments came way after. So I guess, I don't know what you want to call that. In physics, that would be a prediction. In biology, apparently, if it's not in the same paper, it's not a prediction. Um, um, <laughs> um, and... Um, and we could explain interesting things like partially reprogram cells, a bunch of stuff. And I, we were really proud of this. And sociologically, we were destroyed. No one liked it. And I felt devastated. I was like, this is the best idea I've ever had, you know, riding on the coattails of giant. And so I stopped working on it. And I was drawn back in for various reasons because people, 
my biology collaborators started interpreting their data according to our model, which made me feel really good. So I felt like socially validated again or something. And so I started working on this problem again. And the thing that's interesting, of course, in the last decade is how fast the technology and biology moves, right? So we were working with microarray data literally in 2012. And now, which is like bulk data where you get expression for many, many cells together. And now what's happened is that you have this new technology, which is single cell RNA-seq data, where you can measure the gene expression profile of individual cells, right? Very noisy, but still you can do it. And not only that, we were trying to compile these attractors, but like basically there's these huge efforts to compare what they compile what they call cell atlases, which are single cell gene expression profiles of different cell types, right? And our basic idea was, can we use these kind of ideas on our tractors to, to understand um, and combine it with these atlases and revisit this kind of basic idea that we had before? And to do that, I'm going to show you that what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up using these order parameters, like from the projection method. And when you visualize data that way, it's amazing. It's, I mean, I, I was shocked. First of all, I didn't think it was going to work, as usual. My student just pushed, carried on and did it anyway. And then uh, Maria just said, ignored me. But then um, it gives very interesting things. But in order to do that, I have to tell you some things about like why this data is both amazing. But those of you who know me personally know I'm a critic at heart. <laughs> uh, like that's just what I am at heart. Um, and so I have to tell you why it's also not amazing. <laughs> and anyone who works with this data will tell you. Even though you can measure, right? The amazing thing about single cell RNA-seq is who thought you could measure gene expression at the level of an individual cell, right? But the other, the thing I wanna to emphasize to you is that this data is extremely noisy and sparse, like to a crazy degree, right? Like 30, 40% of the genes come in as zero. That's not unheard of. There's humongous technical variability across things. So that's something inherent to it. The second thing is that if I care about understanding cell types and especially closely related cell types, like you know, two very closely related cell types, the thing that's interesting is that cell types are highly correlated. Lung cells look like other lung cells, immune cells look like other immune cells. Things are crazy, right? So we would need a data analysis method that can deal with the fact things are very correlated, right? The same problem we had in the Huffield model and the fact that single cell RNA-seq data is very noisy and sparse. And so what people want to do, the problem they want to do is they want to like take, you know, a typical thing they want to do is they want to say, identify a cell type from data. So what you do is you take all your single cell data. So every point here is a cell. You do some dimensional reduction on it. So visualize it, this is Tisney. People have decided that somehow UMAP is better than TISNI, even though it's exactly the same thing. Um, so you do some dimensional reduction on it. And then what you do is in this low dimensional space, you make some clusters. And then what you say is, oh, I look at the gene expression profile of some gene that I know should be highly expressed. And then I manually annotate the cells, right? So for example, I'm gonna be thinking about lung lineages. This is Michael's data. And you know, you have AT1, AT2, uh, you look at the expression of some profile, right? So like here, they're looking at some lineage of this, you know, AT2 gene thing. So in the middle, on the left is just a dimensional reduction. The middle panel, now I've colored it by AT2 genes. You see that they're high in this cluster. So I call that AT2, AT2, right? That's how you do it. And then you do it with different sets of genes. You do it with another set of genes. And in this way, I get clusters in this low dimensional space. And then I assign everything with the same cluster, that cell type. This is pretty much how all pipelines go. You can use a di different dimensional reduction and you can do whatever you want, but this is what happens. So there's certain problems that just, like I said, critic at heart, critic at heart. So there's certain things when I see these pipelines, on the one hand, it's amazing you can do this. On the other hand, there's things that really bother me about these visualizations and how seriously people take this. One is that this dimensional reduction depends fundamentally on what data I include, what cell types I include. So if I use very distant cell types, I can make things look much closer together. If I use very closely related things, I can exaggerate differences. There's all kinds of things that happen. The second thing that really bothers me as a, as a physicist, because 
you know, is that like, first thing I've been told is that if I make a plot, you should label the axes. I learned this from Phil's book over and over again. I think this is like, I, Phil is the king. I see him on like fourth down on my screen. So I just like, and what do the axes mean here? It just destroys me, right? And part of labeling the axis is having meaningful distances. What do the distances mean? There's lots of hyperparameters. Often when you make these dimensional reduction, you normalize in crazy ways. And then how you normalize gene expression depends on what other samples I've inclu included. That batch effects. Why do we work in the low dimensional space? How do we include these atlases? Because the whole point is dimensional reduction is really expensive. So if I want to integrate all the data of the atlases, do I throw in all the cell types with my with the data sample I care and do dimensional reduction? I don't know. It's, it, it becomes very computationally infeasible and it's not very interpretable, I would say. So the basic thing I want to try to convince you is that you can do much, much better. And you can do much better by just importing this geometric intuition of the hot field model, right? So our basic idea was that these atlases give you the attractors that you care about right? Because these atlases are stable cell types. Those are the patterns I want to store in the dynamical system, which is the gene expression network that makes development. All right. Um, how much time do I have? I'm going to skip this. There's some technical stuff about how we normalize. The important point I want you to take away is that every cell is normalized to itself. So if you give me a single cell, I normalize gene expression in such a way that I basically normalize things by percentile. So every gene is just like, what percentile of expression is it within the cell? All right. So importantly, this doesn't, every cell is normalized independently. That takes care of batch effects and lots of stuff. The second thing that I'm gonna do is, as I said, what we care about is the attractors. And so what we do is we wanna create a reference basis. What patterns do we actually wanna store? So what we do is we go to these atlases or whatever your favorite thing is. We take all the single cell RNA-seq. We average because single cell RNA-seq is so noisy. We average over many cells and this gives me a reference basis. And what I wanna emphasize is all the assumptions in our analysis come in at this step. Cause you have to tell me what patterns and what cell types I care about, right? And then I make you a reference basis. And those are the attractors I want to store. After this, there's no more assumptions. So on one hand, I put in the biology I care about. Like implicitly, we believe in cell types. That's why we make these atlases. And our basic idea is let's take that seriously and be done with what is a cell type discussion. It's an operational definition of what a cell type is. It's whatever is in your basis. And so the basic idea is now I want to like make something. And as I pointed out, as been the emphasis of this first part of the talk, Cell types are correlated. Naive magnetizations aren't good. So what we're going to do instead is going to, we're going to decorrelate the same way we did in the tutorial, which is basically, I'm going to consider, remember these order parameters AMU, which were these decorrelated magnetizations. So what I do is from my reference basis, I calculate the correlations between all my cell types that are in my basis. I calculate the magnetization. And I get this correlations A mu, which basically tell me what's going on. And so all the plots I'm going to show you, I'm going to just start plotting data for you in a second. There's no machine learning. There's nothing. You just give me a reference basis. You give me a new sample. And I calculate these A mu's for you. Right? And I'm going to plot these A mu's. That's what I'm going to plot all the time. And what I like to think about this is that what I've done is that what I've really done is in this projection method is I've taken the cell types I care about and there's, they span some plane in the whole gene expression space. I project down onto the space spanned by the cell types and that's a coordinate system. So I've basically given you a way of transferring between two coordinate systems, a gene expression space coordinate system and a cell type coordinate system. And the cell type coordinate system are these decorrelated magnetizations. And the decorrelations are important because that's why I can really think of them as a reasonable coordinate system. Right? That's the basic idea. That's it. That's the whole idea. It's just linear algebra and non-orthogonal coordinates. 
literally linear algebra and non-orthogonal coordinates, where the, my basis vectors are the cell types I care about. All right. Um, this is just saying this is what our pipeline is. So now I can do different things with it. Once I have the coordinate in this cell type space, right? I can say, oh, if I want to classify cell types, let's just choose the coordinate that's the highest, for example. I can visualize it by taking different slices through this coordinate system in cell type space, right? I can do it in 2D, I can do it in 3D. In principle, I could do it in how many ever cell types I have, but we can only visualize two in 3D. It's one of the great failings of humans um, or our world. I don't know which one. Um, um, and so what I'm gonna show you for the last eight minutes is how this stupid thing gets you really interesting, meaningful visualizations with meaningful axes, meaningful distances, and lets you see lots of stuff, All right? So that's the last eight minutes I have. So as I said, it's as dumb as it seems. We actually normalize in a much simpler way. There's no fit parameters. So this is no fit parameters, right? Zero fit parameters. All you give me is the reference basis. So here is a typical thing you can look at. So here is a data from lungs, right? And the important point is that the basis we use is from a completely different thing. It's from the lung atlas basis. So there's batch effects, all this stuff. It, it doesn't matter. We normalize everything away. And what I've done is on the left, you're going to see these red boxes. That's going to tell me what's going to happen is I'm looking at, uh, sorry, I'm looking at two different 2D slices in this coordinate system, right? Because basically I have like, you know, 100 or 120 cell types. That's all the cell types in the mouse cell atlas. And so I'm going to show you different 2D slices, right? It's just one projection, but I can only visualize two coordinates at a time. So what I've done is here, you'll see that the axes are type one cells and type two cells. Those are in the red box on the left. And what I've done here is I've taken all the cells and each point is a cell and I've just projected it here. And what you can see is that these are labels that were given us given to us with the biologists. We didn't use them for anything. They're just used for false coloring after the fact. And you can see that I can basically look at the projection on cell type one and cell type two. And you see that the AT1 and AT2 separate. Everything has this kind of weird lower score over here. And I want to emphasize this is at the single cell level where everything is 40% zero. I don't know if, if any of you worked in single cell RNA-seq data, you'll realize how amazing this is, that it works, right? And with and batch effects are there because this is the mouse cell atlas and we're using our own data, right? It's projections across labs, across, actually across platforms. <laughs> All right. Now what I can do is I can just change the projection, right? So now I look at ciliated in AT1. Again, very closely related lung and lineages. And you can see all of a sudden the AT2 cells disappear. I get some AT1 cells. I get some, and the ciliated cells pop up up here in the red. All right, so again, meaningful axes. <laughs> and you can see that they probably mislabeled these orange triangles on the bottom right. Those are probably AT1 cells, all right. So you can keep on doing this and you can again, like look at different marker genes. So the top row shows you AT1 market, marker genes and, I, and the bottom, you know, and you can just color these things and everything works out the way it should, right? And, I've, I've, and here I've just shown you different slices. The point is, the you know, top left corner, I don't know why my mouse doesn't work. It's really irritating. Uh, type one and type two cells plotted against each other or ciliated and type two, type one ciliated scored by different genes. And it, it just basically works off the shelf. We do nothing. Like it, we've tried it on millions of data because it's linear algebra and non-orthogonal coordinates. We're not doing anything, right? So what's fun is, you know, you can do this on mouse cell atlas. So, you know, you can like, you can ask, how well can I predict a cell type? It works really well. So I want to emphasize this is average scores of single cell. You can do it on human data. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It, 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 it just, it seems to work off the shelf on everything we've done. And, you know, the classification is actually, if I say, okay, let's take the thing with the highest accuracy, the classification is actually comparable to like fancy machine learning models with number humongous training sets and products and whatever, whatever, you know, it's a little bit worse because it's not fine tuned, but it works on everything, right? So it's always the same thing. Um, 
And so what's fun about it is again, what I'm interested in is watching development, right? And so the idea is that we have these order parameters, just like you want to watch a phase transition, you watch how the order parameter changes in time. We want to watch lung development, right? And so the way people think about lung development and watch it is they make these kind of, I don't know what these plots are, but they're from this science paper, right? And I, again, my problem is like, what is this axis? What does this mean? And then people like watch streams of cells, connect stuff. And they're like, oh, that's like watching development in time. It could be a spring plot. It can be a UMAP plot. But I don't like it because I don't understand what the axes mean, right? And so what's fun is you can do this with all these things, but this is from what's called the, the same paper, the science paper, and we plot some data. And what we do is that what I'm showing you is the projections on these two cell types, T1 and T2. And what I'm showing you is how things develop in time, right? So each point is a, is a cell. And you can see that, you know, at day 12.5, there's nothing like an AT1 and AT2 cell, right? I can get this for any things I want, but it's a short thing. Then, you know, and day 15.5, you get kind of a clump. Day 17.5, you kind of get this kind of spreading out into AT1 and AT2. Then you have this really weird population that our lung biologists are now obsessed with at day three post-birth, which looks like a mixture of AT1 and AT2 that kind of disappears. And then by day 42, you get AT1 and AT2. So it's kind of wild, like, you know, meaningful axes. <laughs> Watching stuff with time, right? And you can, this is all on one plot. My point is I can do this for any cell type I care about. So this is really like visualizing stuff in a high dimensional order parameter space. What's fun and even funner, I have two minutes and that's all I'll need. So this is this famous, you know, um, data set on homeopoietic lineages that alone, you know, uh, alone clients lab put out what they, where they do single cell RNA seq and they barcode cells. And so the idea of barcode is that you can tell what cell came from another cell. I'm not going to can tell much, right? But like pretty good. It's pretty impressive technology. Again, amazing. Critic at heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I feel like I have to put a caveat on everything. It's a very annoying quality. Um, so, um, and so what's fun is like the basic idea is that this is, these are again, paper datas from the paper. They do, they like spring plots, which are another dimensional reduction thing. But the basic idea is you start some clones, right? You barcode them, and then you watch them in time and they say, okay, here they are at day two, here they are at day four, here they're at day six. Then you do some kind of thing where you try to identify, you know, the cell types because you have some genes you care about. And there's this kind of very funny region in the middle, which seems to like give rise to multiple cell types. So they call these bipotent progenitors, right? But part of my problem with all this interpretation is I don't know what the axes mean. I don't know if that distance is close you know, it, it's not nonsense, but it, it is very hard for me to square. Given how quantitative the data is, it seems like we should be able to do better. Let me put it that way. So what you can do is I can just basically look at these things. So on the right, I've shown you the lineages of this homopoietic lineages. So it's blood development. And so I can start with a single clone on the left if you focus, right? And what I can do is I projected it onto these kind of different cell types. So monocytes, neutrophils, and what are called progenitor cells, right? That's the myeloid progenitor at the top. And you can ask what happens. So at day two, this is one clone, right? With the same barcode. You can see that everything, these three yellow dots have a high projection on the progenitor cell, but they have almost no projection, right? On neutrophil or monocytes. And as I basically watch these things develop. You see some of the cells become monocytes in this lineage, and some of them become neutrophils. You kind of see this kind of bifurcation that's happening. And what's interesting is you can do this not just for one clone, for many clones. And then what we've done is we've colored things by basically calculating the average time of things. Oh, hi, yeah. Made. And you can basically watch these things. And what's really interesting about all this stuff oh, I went the wrong way, is that basically you get two kinds of lineages. For some cell types, when I plot it, you see they're mutually exclusive. Like megakaryocytes and neutrophils will never become each other. They just kind of seem to run in opposite direction in time. Same thing with kind of like basophils and neutrophils or minocytes and megakaryocytes. But this kind of 
thing that they emphasize in this paper that you have these kind of hybrid cells that seem not quite monocyte and not quite neutrophil, you can see that you get this kind of cloud kind of developmental trajectory. And we've seen this in lung development. We've seen this many things. So there seem to be some cell types where you plot in this way, you never get anything in the middle. It just really looks like an L. It's like they're really mutually exclusive decisions. Then you have other developmental bifurcation points, which according to the tree up there, if you look at monocyte and neutrophil, they're not the closest thing. Right? You would think it would be neutrophil and basophil, but it's not. You get these kind of cloud hybrid points that pop out. And what's nice is that, again, this is off the shelf. We're just using data off whatever it is, you know, whatever basis you want. These are, order, these are like the equivalent of order parameter and you can watch stuff at single cell, right? And, and it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind, of, kind of wild, right? The orange is early, the darker is late. And so we're really excited about this. Maria, a physicist, is learning R to make an R package so people actually use it. Unbelievable. She was resistant. <laughs> but you know, that's the way it is. Um, and so I think my time is up. Um, so I, again, I want to emphasize the people, person who really did the work. It's Maria. Um, Mike, we couldn't have done this without Michael, you know, answered so many biology questions for us. Daryl and Laertes, I, Laertes has been my, you know, silent. And Daryl, I've been, you know, I've been my silent collaborators and like, uh, and friends now, you know, that's the fun thing about science. You collaborate with people long enough, they become your friends. Uh, and, uh, and uh, lots of people have given me money over the years to think about this. Um, and if you find this kind of crazy nonsense interesting, I do have money for postdocs. Uh, just send me an email. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pankaj. That was, that was fascinating. I'm going to clap on behalf of the audience. And uh, uh, people, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll open it up in a couple of minutes. But let me just start it off by asking a question. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by your statement that uh, if you normalize by individual cells, you get rid of batch effects. Yes. Uh, and so I was I wondering if you could expand on that. And my second question was, let me throw in both of them. And my second question was, uh, does your method also give us insight into um, you know, cell types themselves, you know, what are well-defined and what are not. I'll start with the second one. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe it tells you something about developmental decisions. No, the input of the whole thing is to get around this problem. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. I call an existential philosophical problem. I don't really care what a cell type is. I care about having meaningful axes. So it works. I can tell you there is an implicit answer in this. So mm -hmm. we've been trying to do this earlier and earlier in development, day four, day five, day eight. It's hard to get cells, first of all. So there's two things that are going on. But it's also the cells tend to be very transient. And there we're not sure how well this works. We're still trying to debunk this really early in development. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work off the shelf across labs, but if you give me a good basis within an experiment, it works much better. So it's hard to tell out what the problem is between technical variability because you you have much fewer cells from other stuff. So it's a problem we're thinking about, right? Like how how transient, if I were really transient cell type, whatever yeah. you want to call it, transient mm -hmm. state of a cell, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, what's the difference between a cell state and a cell type? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it strikes me as a religious question. Um, um, but can I use very transient things as meaningful axes in this analysis? Mm -hmm. I'm, not sure. mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And the batch effect things, yeah, the basic idea is just, again, take a cell, right? Order all the genes in that mm -hmm. cell, right? So mm -hmm. then give it a percentile. This is the 99th percentile gene, right? Just like a study section in a 90s mm -hmm. or NSF, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we use as our coordinate. Right, as a z score, so as a percentile, as a z score, mm -hmm. the 99th okay. percentile is 2.8 or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 32nd percentile is minus one. Mm -hmm. And everything that's zero is mapped to whatever the minimum value is minus one. There's just a tie. Mm -hmm. so you usually have a bunch of things that are basically lowly expressed at like minus whatever, and that's all it is. And the whole idea is that the whole idea behind this analysis, I mean, all the statisticians tell me it's nonsense, but I can just tell you, I don't think that's true, um, um, is that um, a cell type is defined. You, there's another way of thinking about gene expression, which is just to say a cell type or any large scale expression profile is also defined by 
what percentile a gene is. So it's like a fundamentally different way of thinking about it. Instead of thinking about it absolutes, I'm going to think about within a cell because I have a high dimensional measurement. I can just say, this gene is always very highly expressed in that cell type. If you think about what that means, it means relative. You can either say it's highly expressed relative to all other cell types, which is what normally people do with normalizations. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say instead, I think of it as highly expressed compared to all the other genes within that same cell type. If mm -hmm. you take it in the second viewpoint, then you don't need any other cell to normalize. That's the basic idea. And because you're normalizing internally, the idea mm -hmm. is batch effects are very unlikely to change the relative order of whether something is high expressed, whether it's 99th percentile, it's very unlikely to make it 50th percentile within a cell. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll make it 98th percentile, 97th mm -hmm. percentile. And that's what, that's what saves you from the batch effects. Mm 